from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of Veeam on 2020. Brought to you by Veeam. Hi everybody, welcome to the Cube's coverage of Veeam on 2020, the virtual version of Veeam on. And I'm here with Justin Warren, who's the chief analyst and managing director of Pivot9. Justin, good to see you. How are things down under? They are not too bad. It was a bit of a rough start to the year, but uh, things are, are looking a little bit better here in the middle of the year. Uh, and of, it's, uh, it's tough times. And of course, um, Justin, you, may, you guys may know as a, as a many time CUBE host, and of course, our other almost daily CUBE host these days, Stu Miniman, joining us to uh, unpack the Veeam keynotes, the trends in the marketplace. How you doing, Stu? I'm doing great, Dave. Yeah, as, as you said, rather than us flying all around the country, we're in, you know, doing remote interviews every day. Uh, it's different, <laughs> 2020. <laughs> so this has been, you know, quite a year, uh, obviously, uh, because it was from, from Veeam's perspective, started out with that blockbuster exit, $5 billion exit to private equity slash VC, Insight Capital, Insight Partners, uh, which was just an awesome thing for the founders and you know, some of the employees and actually going forward now, I think the, 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 the balance of the employees really uh, have an opportunity to grow uh, the valuation of the company even further. Uh, I think that's what we've seen with Insight. I mean, they, they want exits. So it's like, you know, um, they used to talk about, Ratmare used to talk about, you know, uh, act two. <laughs> well, now we're going to see it play out, guys. Um, so uh, just some, some high level stats, a billion dollars last year in bookings. Um, they're really shifting to an ARR model in a big way, 375,000 customers, uh, 160 countries, 4,200 employees. Justin, you remember when you first ran into Veeam at like some Vmug somewhere, you know, and you're like, who are these guys? Wow, they've certainly made it. They, they really have. Um, and it's, it's kind of surprising, but also not. The, the, the feeling when I first encountered Veeam was that it's like, well, who is this people? Yeah, what are they doing? It was very much SMB. It was very much practitioner, very technical focus. And people who used it just, just loved the product because uh, back then the, the informal tagline was it just worked. And in those days, it, it really was amazing that there was a product that was simple and easy to use and worked on it, all of the things that they needed it to do. And they had a very, very VM focus back in that time. Hence the name of, of the entire company was, was called Veeam. And to see it grow from that, what even then was quite a broad base, but a, a very much an SMB market and see it grow across the entire industry is pretty remarkable. There's not really any, not many other companies who've pulled off this kind of growth momentum. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, Justin, I, I think you nailed it there. You know, I, I think back, it's, it's a company that hasn't stay, stay, stayed still though. Um, you know, in the virtualization community, there were ripple effects when Veeam went beyond just doing VMware and started to do Microsoft. Uh, then a few years ago, I remember after we were doing theCUBE at, at the show, you know, there was just a real push forward uh, to extend like the relationship with Microsoft to the cloud. One of the things that, you know, we think we see loud and clear at, at this show is, you know, that VMware relationship is really strong. And as VMware goes to various cloud environments, Veeam can go along with that. So that VMware relationship stays strong, but they're also in a lot of the public clouds and expanding beyond what they're doing. They're moving into the enterprising, and I think one of the things we'll dig into is how enterprise -y is Veeam today, um, but absolutely a company that very different than they were two or three years ago, and Dave, as you, you know, correctly pointed out, now there's not the, hey, who is this weird privately held company? You know, who's the ownership? I think there's a little bit of a, more of an understanding as to, you know, they're, they're a big player in the space, um, and a little bit more, uh, understanding as to where things go going forward. Well, you know, I want to get your take on sort of their, their we're going to go through a lot today, but the vision uh, that Danny Allen laid out in, in his keynote, and I think it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, given the energy and the VC money coming into the market behind Cohesity and Rubric and, you know, the noise that they're making, what he put up as their vision is the most trusted provider of backup solutions that deliver cloud data management. So as you guys well know, uh, cohesity and rubric are really pushing this notion of data management, which means a lot of things to a lot of people. It's interesting to note that, that, that Veeam, they get new, first of all, new management, um, new CEO, Danny Allen now CTO, and obviously in a strategy role. So he's putting forth 
this kind of back to basics uh, mentality, but then leapfrogging, trying to leapfrogging the data management narrative into the cloud, bringing cloud into it, super gluing cloud and data management, which I think is really smart because when you think about uh, multi-cloud data management for data protection, you know, it's, it's got to be about cloud native and it's got to be somebody who's got no, you know, agenda around hardware or even necessarily a public cloud agenda. And Veeam wants to, to be that company. What do you think of that messaging, Justin? Uh, I think, broadly speaking, I think Veeam can pull it off. Uh, I do have some concerns around the whole data management side. So on, on the first thing of just being able to pull this off across the, the industry, I think Veeam is well-placed because it's always been about software um, and it's always been about partnership. So Veeam has been channel, was 100% channel uh, back in the day, very, very little direct, if, if any at all. They're very strong on partnerships. They, they will partner with anybody because basically they don't really mind who else you deal with, they just want your backup to be done through Veeam. Um, and the backup is, is very strong. The, that, that is what they are great at. So the, the risk to me on the data management side is that we've seen this, this play before. Uh, pretty much every, every backup company at some point starts to talk about, hey, we, we have a copy of all of your data. Um, it's kind of sitting there not really doing anything. What if we were to turn this into something else and start using it for other, other purposes? but it's never really put, paid off for anybody. No, no one's really done anything with their backup data in a, in, a, in a true sense, because we haven't seen anyone else become very good at that and, and be known throughout the industry of, oh yes, once you've backed up your data to this thing, you can then do all of this other stuff with it. I, I can't name anyone who's actually been, been quite successful at that, but I can name plenty of people who've tried. Well, Commvault has certainly tried. Actually, guys, why don't you bring up the, the sort of competitive slide? I want to sort of ask a good lead in, Justin. So what this, this data from our data partner, ETR Enterprise Technology Research, those who watch our breaking analysis every week, you see that we use this data extensively. And basically what we're showing here is the fundamental methodology that ETR uses is this thing called net score, which is kind of like net promoter score. It, it basically asks customers, are you buying you increasing spending or decreasing spending takes, takes the less, subtracts it from the more, and then you get a net score. That's the vertical axis, and it's an indicator of spending velocity. The horizontal axis, it's labeled market share. It's not like IDC counts market share. It's a measure of market, it's pervasiveness within the survey. Then it's calculated by the mentions of the vendor divided by the total number of mentions within that sector. Now, what we're showing here is a comparison of pure play data protection vendors and you can see there's no Dell EMC, there's no, no IBM, because they're not pure plays. I, I can't cut the data by data protection, so I got to put, put forth the pure plays. But let's, let's walk through this. So what you can see here is you've got um, the pervasive company, and in the upper left you can see uh, the, the, the net scores, and you can see the, so the shared end. So this is 1,269 survey respondents, and you can see the shared end is the, the presence of these companies within that 1269 and CIOs and IT practitioners. So you can see Commvault, you know, very high presence, but then interestingly, and I guess not surprisingly, Veeam right there, and then it drops off Veritas, Rubrik, and a Cohesity. And you can see where the heat map is on the vertical axis. Rubrik, one of the highest uh, net scores in the data set. And then you got Cohesity, also very high, not as great of a, a presence in the data set. Um, you can see Veeam, very respectable. This is a 15 year old company with a relatively high net score. You know, really, really respectable, as I say, in the, you know, solidly in the, in the mid 30s. And then Commvault, you know, getting into the pink zone uh, and then Veritas in the red zone, low net score um, and, and not as great a, great a presence, which, you know, some, some con concerns there for Veritas. So that's guys, that's the horses on the track. Anything there surprise you? Uh, well, Veritas's position is, um, well, it doesn't really surprise me, but it is, it is remarkable just how far away from the rest of the, the players that they are. Um, certainly that matches in the conversations that, that we're having here with customers and, and others in, in the industry. The name Veritas just does not come up in the way that it used to. Um, it used to be, I would, I would have said that it would be, used to be neck and neck with, with Commvault. 
uh, now we really don't hear the name Veritas much at all. Uh, which, as as a you know, long time participant in the industry, Veritas was very much part of my career. Very you know, early on, they they were a standby name. They were very well respected. So to see see that sort of ha- see that th- sort of thing happen to a, a great company like Veritas is is a bit sad, really. Well, um, you mean look at it, you're right. The Veritas was always the the gold standard of of a company with with no no hardware agenda. You know who's going to be the Veritas of X. You know what we, you would always use that sort of you know line uh, or phrase. Uh, but now, Stu, when I think about the opportunities here. Uh, it seems like multi-cloud is, is going to, within the data protection space, is going to be won by somebody who can do cloud native. So in other words, running cloud native on, on Azure or AWS and, and Google, maybe Alibaba, but cloud native, being able to take advantage of those native services on the cloud. Somebody who's got a, an on-prem presence, who can bring that cloud experience on-prem, who actually uh, can do it also across clouds uh, at very, very, High performance, low latency, very efficient, low cost. So in thinking about that multi-cloud landscape, Stu, how do you assess the horses on the track? Yeah, well, you know, Dave, first of all, one of the things Justin said, you know, Veeam is partner driven. Uh, you know, one of the conversations I'm having for Veeam on is with the, the partner alliance team, they are 100% partner driven. And also, you know, for so many years we talk about, you know, one of the negatives about Veeam is like, oh, well, most of their customer base is SMB. Well, you know, if you look at the cloud, you know, one of the knocks against cloud for a long time was like, oh, it's, it's just the really small companies that are doing a lot of cloud. Well, you know, my data manages, whether I'm a small company or a big company. So a lot of these pieces come together. Uh, Veeam has really been able to move into that cloud environment. Uh, what they're doing uh, spans across them. You know, data protection seems to be one of those areas when you talk about you know, the, the, the mantras of the industry like Amazon and say, okay, when are they going to eat your business? Well, you know, Amazon's got a strong storage team, but data protection, they, they've got some very basic functionality in there, but there's, there's a robust ecosystem and companies like Veeam uh, can capitalize on. Well, you know, you mentioned the, their, the enterprise, of course, we all know the story of a couple of years ago, they had a big enterprise push. They brought in some executives from VMware, some really high quality folks. They struck relationships with companies like HPE and Cisco. I think HPE in particular is, has paid off you know, quite well, but everybody wants to do business with Cisco because they're very partner friendly. And it's interesting, they, they kind of pulled back uh, from that, not kind of, they pulled back on that major initiative and you know, the high priced uh, direct sales people. And I remember doing a breaking analysis um, when Veeam got acquired, or maybe it was even previous to that, and making the comment that, yeah, they had to pull back on that, but I dug into the ETR data, Veeam actually has quite a presence in large companies. Uh, maybe it's division of a large company, or maybe it's shadow IT, I don't know. People who just you know, want the simple, simple backup, but they're VMware customers. And it seems to me they really have an opportunity to go up market, uh, maybe kind of to reset that enterprise strategy. What, what do you guys think? Yeah, I think that's, that was what they were trying to do a couple of years ago. Um, so I think partly they just didn't succeed as quickly as they had hoped. Um, there was also a, a little bit of an issue, which is something I remember speaking to Ratmir about some years ago, uh, about the challenge of being able to serve these different markets. Because what SMB wants is quite different to what Enterprise wants. And being able to fulfill both of those needs simultaneously from one company is really challenging because things that you do for enterprise annoy SMB, the things that around complexity, um, to be able to deal with the, the, com the inherently complex environments that are enterprise, SMB just doesn't have that issue. Um, whereas if you can only do things in SMB type ways, that annoys the enterprise. Being able to satisfy both of those markets in a, in a way that they're both happy with, and so that no one else feels neglected, that's pretty much what they were, ch they were struggling with, I think. So the, the hard pivot to enterprise, meant that their, their existing customer base, which then was, was fully, mostly SMB, they started to feel a little bit neglected. So it was just a bit of a stumble. I think it, it feels like they've reset now and understood how to do this in a slightly more gentle fashion, if we can call it that. So rather than going for that really aggressive push into enterprise, they're just following the natural momentum, which is people who've come from SMB and 
some of those medium companies grow into very large companies and bring Veeam with them. And others are just that people as they move through their career will go from a small company to maybe a medium company and then they'll end up in a division of an enterprise company. And they're used to Veeam and they want to bring what they, they know and like. They want to bring that experience to the company that they now work at. So there's a sort of natural flow there, I think, for Veeam that is only now showing the fruit of what was actually laid down a few years ago. Well, and I think there was something else going on there too, which is we now know the company was you know, positioning for an, for an exit and was up for sale. And so the enterprise is very expensive. It's time consuming. The ROI is oftentimes you know, very long. That's why you see enterprise you know, startups raising you know, gobs of money and they just, I think, weren't getting the ROI. And when you think about Insight, you know, this is one of the, the more forward thinking like PE or VC firms. They'll live with a, you know, the rule of 40, right? Where, or a rule of 35 or even rule of 50 where it's not just about growth. It's about growth plus EBIT. And if you, you add those up and it adds to 40 or 45 or 35 or wherever their target is, I don't know about exactly what uh, Insight's looking for, but, but that's the combination that drives value. So my guess is they wanted to you know, dial up EBIT for the sale and they might've had specific targets, uh, who knows, that were pre-negotiated. Uh, but I think that probably had something to do with it. And as well, uh, as you're pointing out, Justin, it takes time, but now Stu, if we look into you know, some of the things that we're hearing from the messaging, you know, some of the announcements, and we'll, you know, we'll get into that, um, big, big uh, discussion around digital transformation, uh, uh, one of the first, if not the first, to uh, do a backup for Office 365, you know, another, a new version for, of, of, of Veeam backup for AWS. Uh, so there were some, you know, enterprise-y types of things that they were, they were talking about, um, a little glimpse at, at version 11. Um, any thoughts there, Stu? Yeah, uh, well, you know, David, it's, it's interesting. You know, Justin put out, out a really good point there. When you talk digital transformation, Dave, you know, one of the things we've been saying for years, the, the difference between a company before and after that is you're leveraging the data. So, you know, if I, I look at Veeam and say, you know, do I protect the data? Absolutely. Do I secure your data? I'm involved with that. Uh, actually, you know, one of the leadership changes, they just hired their first CISO. Uh, so, you know, bigger push into security that will help them a lot uh, in, you know, what, what they do in the public sector. That's where the CISO actually came from the public sector side. That will help them. But what I didn't, haven't heard as much yet is, you know, okay, I'm a piece of that data, and if you're going to the cloud, I can, you know, manage, I, I can protect it and secure it. But how do I help connect people to get more value out of the data and leverage that data? So uh, I, I think Justin, you know, nailed it with that. Um, you know, so many pieces that are important about data that Veeam does do, uh, but that you know, uh, like the discussion we always have in AI is, you know, it's it, it be able to take that raw data and converting it into insights and outputs. Well, to Justin's point earlier about data management, um, and, and I want to pick up on what you were saying uh, about uh, security. Obviously, everybody's talking about ransomware, but to me, you know, you, you talk about the CISO. The role of the CISO is, is of course evolving. It's now a board level topic, but the CISO, you know, oftentimes was off as a peer, I say off, but as a peer to the CIO, on purpose, they didn't want the, the CISO to report to the CIO because it would have been like the fox watching the hen house. But I think, because it, it, it was this sort of failure equals fire mentality and they wanted the truth. But I think now people have transparent discussions at the board about security. Hey, we know we're going to get penetrated. It's all about our response. Obviously we have to deal with the layers, but we're, we're exposed, everybody's exposed. So I think increasingly organizations are realizing that you know, it's a team sport, you've got to get everybody involved, the lines of business, the users being responsible, and of course IT. My, my point is that security and data protection are now becoming two sides of the, the same coin, almost like privacy, we've, we've shared that before. So when you think about digital transformations, you think about data protection as part of your security portfolio, not just something that you bolt on as an afterthought. And I think in many respects, Justin, that's maybe a bigger market opportunity for a lot of these data protection companies and backup companies than you know, the so-called opaque data management that you're referring to before. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that because what I'm seeing from the security side of the, 
of the market, particularly within within large enterprises, a, a change in mindset from a prevention to a resilient a kind of mindset around and how to deal with this. So previously there was a lot of um, either we'll just ignore it because it's not really a problem and it's not going to happen to us. Uh, then it became a kind of a fear response of just we want to prevent it ever happening to us. Now it's kind of we've gone to an acceptance. I don't know, we're going through the Kubler-Ross um, <laughs> framework for dealing with grief. Um, people are understanding that sooner or later bad things are going to happen to us. What we need to figure out is how we deal with it when it does. And that, that's the mindset that you need to have when you're talking about data protection. So it's, it's the same kind of mindset that you need for security. And now people are starting to look at, okay, how do we firstly detect if we've actually got a problem? If there's a breach or if there's a risk, how do we notice that we, and know that that's happening? And then once we notice that, what do we do about it? So that's things like catching it early so that when you, your recovery is small, uh, which is the same general idea around software development of fail fast. You want to detect the failures early so that you can correct them all. Basically, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And then once you've figured that out, okay, now how do we recover from this in a way that is, is minimally disruptive to the business? And that could be like recovering from ransomware, having a, a really solid backup that you can restore quickly. That's the best protection against ransomware that you can have. Um, then you can start trying to figure out, okay, we know we can recover if it happens to us. Now let's just try to reduce the number of times that this does actually happen. That's the general idea that I'm seeing come through far more often with CISOs, with CIOs, and with board level conversation. I want, I want to come back to Justin and then Stu and, and with your final thoughts. Justin, I want to get your take on this Veeam Universal license. Um, was this a case of, hey, we had so much complexity across our portfolio, like the the, you know, you go to the Italian restaurant, you just, you, 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 you want everything in the menu or there's too much to figure out, just order for me. Um, and, and they're trying to clean that up or, or do you see this as sort of a more innovative licensing approach that's more cloud friendly? Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, I think it's a bit of both. I, I think it's part of Veeam's ethos as well. Again, from back in the, the very early parts of the company, the idea was that it just works. It, it should be simple and easy to use. So it's completely on brand for Veeam to have a simple and easy to use licensing model. There's a lot of uh, criticism from enterprise and particularly from medium and, and small business for overly complicated licensing models. Um, we see people wrestling daily with the billing system within AWS. We see people fr frustrated with the licensing approach of Oracle. We see them similarly frustrated when you start figuring out exactly what have I licensed and what what am I not licensed for in, in Microsoft's ecosystem? So for them to have a simple and easy to use licensing approach just fits right in with the rest of what the company is doing. It does also simplify the way that they organize and operate their company as they have to deal with lots and lots of different partners. Having a complicated licensing system on top of all of those other complicated licensing systems would just make their own job much, much harder. So this way it actually works for Veeam as well as for their customers. Yeah, simplicity is the watchword there, Stu. And I, get, I mean, I get the sense in, in speaking to Veeam customers and partners that Veeam will, has basically has the philosophy, make it easy to consume and we'll sell more. We're not going to try to micromanage, you know, to maximize revenue. You heard this certainly from some of their big partners who said that Veeam made it transparent to our salespeople for commissions and their salespeople and, 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 and really make it easy to do business with. Uh, so, Stu, I'll give you uh, the last word here. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Veeam also listening and seeing what their partners are doing. So uh, we've watched uh, companies like AWS trying to make a little bit simpler uh, as to if I'm choosing compute, I don't have to be locked into one model, uh, I'll pay those across the environment. Or, you know, Pure Storage, another partner of, of Veeam's, uh, you know, if I stay a customer, I make it easy to be able to move from one generation to the next. So that cloud-like model uh, absolutely is is what we expect. Um, and you know, when you talk to customers today, we know the only constant is change. Uh, um, I, I actually loved in the keynote uh, there was, I believe it was Satya Nadella that they quoted and said that you know we've seen more change in the last two months um, than we normally would see in a decade. So. Um, Veeam being agile, moving, listening to their customers, learning with their partners, um, and making sure that they've got uh, things uh, in the modern consumption model. 
Well, guys, thanks for helping us break down uh, VeeamON 2020, some of the key trends in the marketplace and some of the commentary on the keynotes. Justin, Warren, Stu Miniman, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. And thank, and thank you for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante for Stu and Justin and the entire CUBE team. Keep it right there. We'll be back with our coverage of VeeamON 2020 right after this short break. Thank you.